Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense. Today is the second video in our discussion of the sympathetic autonomic nervous system. We are in a glorious playlist called Physiology. What is sympathetic? Fight, flight. Imagine that you're running from a tiger. You're running for your life. So your heart is bumping faster and harder. Your lung is dilating. Your spleen is squeezing blood into the circulation. Your adrenal medulla is secreting epinephrine and norepinephrine. Your kidney is secreting renin. Your eye's upper eyelid is elevated. Your pupil is dilated. And your lens is not accommodated. Your liver is breaking down glycogen into glucose so that you can burn it in glycolysis and make you some energy. Let's answer the question of the previous video. Regarding the greater splanchnic nerve, which is sympathetic, by the way, each of the following is true except it increases your hematocrit. Yes, because it squeezes your spleen to release red blood cells in the circulation. This will increase your packed cell volume or your hematocrit value. So A is true, therefore it's not the answer because we're asking about except. B, it relaxes the pyloric sphincter. Okay, I'm running from a tiger. Do I want my GI tract to work? No. So let me relax the wall and contract the sphincter. So this is not true. I should contract the sphincter. This could be the answer. Let's continue. It increases your blood epinephrine. Absolutely. Because it tells your adrenal medulla to secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine. D. It increases your blood glucose. Sure. Let's break down the glycogen in the liver into glucose. So this is not the answer. The answer here is it relaxed because this is not true. It contracts your pyloric sphincter. Sympathetic is thoracolumbar, parasympathetic is craniosacral. Now speaking of the sympathetic, it has lateral group of ganglia and collateral group of ganglia. If I wish to supply the pyloric sphincter, which is part of the foregut, I will go from the spinal cord into the celiac trunk. Next to it is a celiac ganglia, and then I will follow the artery until we reach the pyloric sphincter to contract it, because I don't want to digest right now. Sympathetic comes out of T1 through T12 plus L1, L2, and L3, according to some textbooks. Other textbooks will just say L1 and L2. Who cares? A ganglion is a collection of somas or cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. Does the sympathetic originate from the brain? No, it's thoracolumbar spinal cord. Does the sympathetic originate from your spinal cord? It depends. If this is thoracolumbar, yes. Other than that, no. Let's say that this is thoracolumbar T1 until L3. Here is your lateral horn cell. Sympathetic originates here and then goes with the ventral root until it reaches its beautiful ganglia. This, this ganglion could be in the prevertebral or the paravertebral. Most of the time it's in the paravertebral ganglia. We call them the sympathetic chain. Sympathetic coming out of the lateral horn cells into the efferent or ventral root or ramus and then in the spinal nerve we will relay in a ganglia. Most of the time it's in the sympathetic chain also known as paravertebral ganglia. Sometimes it's in the prevertebral. Preganglionic fibers are B-type. These are myelinated. They appear white because myelin is white. We call these the white rami communicans. Postganglionic fibers are C-type, non-myelinated. They appear gray. We call them the gray rami communicans. Sympathetic is fight-flight. Parasympathetic is rest-digest, read and take a dump. Most of the sympathetic ganglia are paravertebral. We call this the sympathetic chain. Others are prevertebral. They are in the midline. I just didn't have a space. Okay, Medicosis, you have told me that the sympathetic is thoracolumbar. Why do we have sympathetic ganglia in the cervical area? Because some sympathetic fibers need to supply the eye. And for them to supply the eye, they will go to this ganglia. They will not relay. They will just ascend. They will relay here in the superior cervical ganglia because this is the one closest to your eye. And then it supplies your eye, dilating your pupil, elevating your upper eyelid and causing exophthalmus. Sympathetic response was discussed in the previous video. In a nutshell, we break down glycogen into glucose, a source of energy. We break down, break down lipids into free fatty acids, a source of energy. We get some oxygen by dilating your bronchi. Get me more oxygen. Let's burn this. And the CVS system will help us transport this energy into the cell. Give me some work. Give me some heat. This is a catabolic system. Sympathetic will vasoconstrict all of your vessels except coronary vessels because your heart needs to beat faster and skeletal muscle vessels because you're running from a tiger. 
sympathetic nervous system, origin, relay, and reach, origin, lateral horn cell, be specific, where, thoracolumbar, be specific, from T1 all the way up to L2 or L3, relay, it could be in lateral ganglia, most of the time, this is called the sympathetic chain, or prevertebral or collateral ganglia, and these are in the midline, in front of the spinal cord, next to the major vessels of the foregut, midgut, and hindgut, respectively, reach, out of these 15 preganglionic thoracolumbar fibers, two will reach your head and neck, namely T1 and T2, because these are the highest, these are the closest to your head and neck. How about thorax? Four. Abdomen? Six. Pelvis? Four. So it's always an even number. The abdomen is the biggest area, it takes six. Thorax and pelvis smaller, four and four. Head and neck the smallest, just two. T1 and T2. This is the most important slide in the entire stinking video. Sympathetic function, head and neck, origin, lateral horn cell at T1 and T2 only because we are just going to head and neck. Relay in the highest most ganglia, cervical ganglia, especially the superior cervical ganglia. This is part of the lateral. This is paravertebral. Functions in the eye, three functions, elevation of your upper eyelid, midriasis, which is dilation of the pupil, and exophthalmus, which is protrusion of the eyeball. On the skin, do you want to bleed right now? Shut up. So vasoconstrict my vessels to decrease bleeding and to shift my blood to more important areas, such as the heart and skeletal muscle, and to increase my blood pressure. Also, erection of the piloerector muscles. This is not very prominent in humans, but it's very prominent in animals such as cats. Their hair will just straighten up so that they can frighten their enemies. Salivary glands. Sympathetic will help you secrete thick visit secretion. Is this for digestion? Shut up. Who cares about digestion right now? This is to make you thirsty. Oh, there's a very thick saliva I need to drink. Why drink? To replenish your body with water, to treat your dehydration, and to cool down your body after running from a tiger. Also to maintain a robust blood pressure. What's going to happen if I have a disease here? It's called Horner syndrome. Horner syndrome could be a problem in the origin, which is lateral horn cell at T1 and T2 spinal segments, or it could be a problem in the ganglia, which is the cervical ganglia, namely the superior cervical ganglia. This can happen in lung cancer, especially if it's a cancer at the apex of your lung. If it's at the apex, it's usually squamous cell carcinoma or small cell carcinoma. Manifestations, the opposite of all of these. Instead of elevation of upper eyelid, you get ptosis, which is drooping of the upper eyelid. Instead of midriasis, you get meiosis. Instead of exophthalmus, you get anophthalmus. Instead of sweating, you get anhydrosis, and therefore you'll have warm red skin. Where does that happen? Is this unilateral or bilateral? Just unilateral. Is this epsilateral or contralateral? It's epsilateral. So if this lung cancer is on the right side, you'll have Horner syndrome in the right side. Your right eye will have ptosis meiosis. Your right half of the face will have anhydrosis. Next, sympathetic in the thorax origin. Lateral horn cell T1 to T4. Yeah, the thorax takes four. Relay, cervical and upper thoracic. This is part of the lateral or paravertebral ganglia. In the heart, I increase all the cardiac properties, heart rate and stroke volume. In the lungs, I cause bronchodilation and I decrease their secretion. Do you want to cuff some sputum while running from a tiger? Shut up. Next, abdomen, sympathetic origin, lateral horn cell, T7 to T12. Relay. Now, these are collateral ganglia, such as celiac and superior mesenteric. These are collateral, these are pre-vertebral. Functions, the function here is by the greater splanchnic nerve. So, greater splanchnic nerve, sympathetic in the abdomen. Lesser splanchnic nerve is sympathetic in the pelvis. Cool, tell me about the greater splanchnic nerve. Let's shut the entire GI tract. Relax the wall, contract the sphincter. No more digestion or absorption. Spleen, squeeze it to increase the hematocrit value. Adrenal medulla, secrete epinephrine, nor epinephrine. Kidney, secrete renin. Liver, break down glycogen into glucose. Constrict all of the vessels. I don't want any blood here. I want all the blood to go to the heart and skeletal muscles. Pelvis, sympathetic, origin, lateral horn cell. Where? T12 and L1, 2 and 3. Relay, inferior mesenteric ganglia. This is collateral. This is prevertebral. Functions through the lesser splanchnic nerve and presacral nerve. The distal half of the colon from here, you see this is proximal, two thirds. This is greater splanchnic. The distal one third of the transverse colon and then the descending sigmoid rectum, etc. This is lesser splanchnic gland. This is pelvis. 
what do you want to do? I want to contract the internal sphincter because the internal is involuntary. I cannot touch the external because the external is somatic. It's not autonomic. When it comes to the urinary bladder, I'll also contract the internal sphincter so that you do not urinate while running from a tiger. I'll also relax the walls. How about the effect on the male copulatory organ? Sympathetic has the S, so shoot and shrink with the S. However, parasympathetic with a P, it points. So, erection. Sympathetic's effect on the eye, we start here, T1, and then we go to T1 ganglion. We will not relay, it will just pass as is. We will relay in the highest most ganglia because this is the one closest to your eye. This is called the superior cervical ganglia. And then we'll have a very long postganglionic nerve called the long ciliary nerve reaching your eye, telling your dilator pupillae muscle, which is a radial muscle, to actually contract. When this muscle contracts like this, your pupil will dilate and increase in size. Beautiful. If this is a preganglionic sympathetic, it secretes acetylcholine. But if this is a postganglionic sympathetic, it will secrete norepinephrine. Don't ever say epinephrine, just norepinephrine. Why not epinephrine? Because this nerve ending lacks the enzyme necessary to convert norepinephrine to epinephrine. Oh, so epinephrine is not going to happen. What's the name of this glorious enzyme? It's called PNMT, phenylethanolamine N for normal methyl transferase. Why do you call it normal? Because epinephrine is super normal. It's very valuable. It's unbelievable. On the other hand, your adrenal medulla actually possesses the beautiful enzyme PNMT, phenylethanolamine N methyl transferase. Therefore, the adrenal medulla can transform norepinephrine into epinephrine. Therefore, the adrenal medulla can secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine. Let's talk about your adrenal medulla. Sure, phenylalanine, tyrosine, dopa, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine. Again, phenylalanine, tyrosine, dopa, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine. Does the adrenal medulla have PNMT? Yes. Therefore, it can convert norepinephrine to epinephrine. Your adrenal medulla can secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine and some dopamine. However, if you are the sympathetic nerve terminus, postganglionic, you do not have this enzyme. You can only secrete dopamine or norepinephrine period, you can never secrete epinephrine. Okay, so I'm a post-ganglionic sympathetic. I can secrete only norepinephrine, never epinephrine. Where is this norepinephrine made? Site of synthesis is in the wide area. So it has lots of stuff, rough endoplasmic reticulum, nucleus, ribosome, etc. It can actually make you some protein, such as norepinephrine. But the site of storage and release is the axon terminus, or the knob. Tell me about norepinephrine. It's made by postganglionic sympathetic fibers. Why do we call them adrenergic? Because they secrete noradrenaline. Who makes it? The soma of the postganglionic adrenergic fibers. Then it gets released by the axon terminus. What's the process? Phenylalanine, tyrosine, dopa, dopamine, norepinephrine, and sta, because you are in a nerve. If you are in the adrenal medulla, phenylalanine, tyrosine, dopa, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine because the adrenal medulla has the PNMT enzyme. Storage in granular vesicles, they have a protein called granin. How does norepinephrine get released? We need an action potential. Get some calcium ions in. This is called the voltage-gated calcium channel. Calcium comes in. Calcium is the hero of contraction and exocytosis. Okay, norepinephrine has done its job. How can we metabolize it, degrade it, and get rid of it? Active reuptake, let's recycle it first. Diffusion into the bloodstream, this makes you alert. And destruction by two enzymes, MAO and COMT. MAO is monoamine oxidase found at the mitochondria of kidney, liver, and nervous system, especially the presynaptic neurons. There is another enzyme called COMT. Action of norepinephrine is generalized. It's all over your body because it can diffuse to the bloodstream. Blood will take it all over your body. Sites. Postganglionic sympathetic fibers, they always secrete norepinephrine with two exceptions. Exception number one, sweat glands. Exception number two, in very few textbooks, blood vessels of skeletal muscles. What are the receptors waiting for norepinephrine? We have alpha receptors and beta receptors. So these are the fibers that you have. Any preganglionic thing secretes acetylcholine. Perfect. All of the somatic fibers that are going to skeletal muscles, they all secrete acetylcholine as well. If you secrete acetylcholine, we'll call you cholinergic. Now tell me about the postganglionic. It depends. If you are sympathetic, you'll secrete norepinephrine and we call you adrenergic because this is noradrenaline. But if you are parasympathetic, you'll secrete acetylcholine and we'll call you 
cholinergic. There is exception to this rule. If you are sympathetic going to the sweat gland, you will not secrete norepinephrine. In fact, you will secrete acetylcholine. Some very, very sophisticated textbook will divide sweat glands into thermoregulatory and apocrine or stress sweat gland. The thermoregulatory actually secrete acetylcholine, but the apocrine just secrete norepinephrine, just like good old sympathetic. Really, I don't care. Just remember that sweat glands receive acetylcholine through sympathetic postganglionic fibers. In the next video, we'll talk about parasympathetic nervous system. And here is today's question. Please pause and let me know the answer in the comment section. You'll find the answer in the next video. If you're struggling with pharmacology, muscarinic agonist, muscarinic antagonist, adrenergic agonist, adrenergic antagonist, ganglion blocker, etc., check out my autonomic pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. It will help you smash pharmacology so that you can take care of patients. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to get my autonomic pharmacology course, medicosisperfectionalis.com. Thank you so much for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.